Humans heavily relied on tools to climb to the top of the food pyramid, but a lot of species simply don't have those opposable thumbs, don't have thumbs at all, or just downright lack any engineering spirit. So sometimes, to get the job done, animals seek out different species' complementing stats. The pairings don't depend on each other biologically, but form mutualistic relationships in which their interactions result in positive, mutually beneficial outcomes. On this episode, we talk about some of these unlikely friendships and work relationships. The first duo you probably know about, but I'm still including it in the video because it arguably goes the hardest. Ravens and wolves. Wolves are vigilant apex predators, however they are confined to the ground, that's where ravens come in. No, not like that, but it's highly intelligent scavengers that act as aerial meal detectors. Ravens help wolves find the food using special calls to lead them to their next meal. Wolves make the kill have their fill and the leftovers, or carry-on, are then enjoyed by up to 140 ravens that just hang around the pack. But there's more to this relationship. These two species frequently spend time together outside of hunting and eating. Ravens have been observed to have fun with the wolves, flying around quite low so young pups can try and catch them, or playing tug of war with sticks. However, arguably the best part about this relationship is, at no point did the birds think. Hey, these guys are pretty good at helping us get food and stuff. And they're kind of fun to fool around with. Should we crossbreed them enough to become unrecognizably deformed and have back problems? Ah, uh, nah. But I mean, come on. This serves as proof why goths and jocks need to team up. Also, last but not least, their mutualism gave birth to some of the most insane 2010 fashion. The next pair is very dear to my heart. Before I say anything, please look at this photograph, because it is the most he asked for no pickles image I've ever seen. This is the less than an inch wide dotted humming frog. This is an 8 inch tarantula. Both live in the rainforest. This one eats tiny bugs. This one eats, well, small guys like this fella. Especially if they're trespassing on its territory. But the dotted humming frog is an exception from the menu. Why? Because it specializes in eating ants. More specifically, the ants that regularly seek out the tarantula eggs to feast on. As well as small parasites. The frog keeps the tarantula's egg safe and in return, the spider lets it live near or inside its burrow and protects it from predators such as other spiders and small snakes. Now, not all tarantulas eat their partners after mating, but you know, the males don't really stick around and help raise the kids or anything. A lot of articles refer to this frog as a spider's pet, but I see this guy as more of a gentle stepdad that stepped up type of figure. And this is just what all Gen Z couples look like, is it not? We discussed an interspecies mutual relationship based on food and one based on protection. These next two are based mainly on toilet habits. You might have seen this image of a mountain shrew taking a shit butter stow in a pitcher plant. Well, the story behind how this came to be is a simple trade offer. You receive nectar from the conveniently angled lid of my modified pitcher. I receive your nitrogen rich dookie. Researchers have concluded that these special toilet pitchers are quite ineffective in terms of capturing prey. Possibly because in the mountain areas they can be found in, insects are quite scarce. So instead of relying on insects, the plants get anywhere between 57 to 100% of their nitrogen needs met by shrews eating the exudes they secrete from their lids while pooping in them. And this makes me feel mad and grateful for modern toilets, not gonna lie. Like, imagine the tank lid of your toilet opens up to give you access to your morning cereal as you sit down for your morning dump, leaves you with so much extra time to lock in. Bonus fun fact, shrews are more closely related to cats than rodents. Whoa. The woolly bat also frequents another carnivorous pitcher plant found in Borneo. This pitcher also produces nectar from its rim, luring in insects and small vertebrates to their death. But not this guy. The woolly bat freely uses the plant's tube-like structure as a quiet resting hole. It's allowed to do this because, again, it's pooping in there. And the plant gets essential nutrients from the guano. And the way these guys find the plant is pretty cool. The pictures have a way of reflecting a bat's call back to it. It's literally a toilet with a satellite dish. Again, we need to step up our game in terms of our restroom facilities. So to sum this section up, don't shit where you eat my ass, these motherfuckers know what's up. The final group I'll be talking about don't exchange any resources, they just make up for what the other lacks. A commonly known example of this is ostriches and zebras. Zebras have excellent eyesight, but their sense of smell is poor. Well, ostriches have piss poor eyesight, but their sense of smell is exceptional. And sticking around works quite well for them because they eat the same thing and the same things eat them. But quite a few 
little animals are ready to lend their eyes to a friend in need. Another famous example, Baby the Cow and her volunteer guide pig Lulu. You know, this melts my heart because I mean, yeah, we invented glasses so my genetically compromised ass can read subtitles on the TV, but who needs glasses when you can just have a little guy? Which leads me to the final pairing for this episode. We all know that pistol shrimps are undoubtedly the most hardcore thing in the ocean, but they're tiny and have very poor vision. So they heavily rely on their watchman slash seeing fish slash best friend that's also using your place as a crash pad, the goby fish. And the symbiotic relationship these two form lasts a lifetime. They bond as juveniles and in adulthood still live in the same burrow. Which keep in mind, the burrows the shrimp make are essential to the goby. The fish use them to hide from predators and also get freaky. Now you decide if this is heartwarming or not, but the goby's mating ritual is quite rowdy. As in they shake up the whole place. So while they're going at it, the shrimp is just digging and ensuring the burrow doesn't collapse, resulting in a longer and more successful mating cycle for the goby. And that's a real best friend right there. This situation also really reminds me of, you know how Mormons can have premarital sex, but if you're just there and someone is shaking the bed, resulting in a backwards and forwards motion, well that's technically not intercourse because it's not you doing it. Now imagine if the gobies had Mormonism and the pistol shrimp's 62 mile per hour claw punch is what's hitting the bed. Obviously the goby has it good, but how does the pistol shrimp benefit from all this? As I said before, rice fry over here can't see. So whenever a predator is nearby, the goby will alert the shrimp and they go into their little burrow together to hide. But how does the goby do this? They're constantly holding hands. Well, holding fins and antenna slash tentacles, but it's still cute. And sometimes the goby also spits food out for the shrimp, also cute. Now for the honorable mentions. Mushrooms and trees, I have a whole video on that. Humans and wolves, but 15,000 years ago. Me and your mom. These three birds in their respective dining carriages. A bird that actually works for its food alongside the honey badger. The first 15 minutes of Finding Nemo. The entire 19 minutes of Shark Tale. And so nearly, the entire Lion King free. Those were all the unusual alliances I wanted to talk about today. Feel free to form a symbiotic relationship with me by subscribing. Or write in the comments what you think is a cool or unusual animal pair. Also, did you think I've forgotten? Gamer subs. The only drink that combines flavor and titties and caffeine and cat ears. Although there are non-anime girl caffeine free options and the years are an add-on, but this is the optimal experience. And for an even better experience, you can use my code POOPY for 10% off. I personally recommend the pina colada or dragon fruit punch, but there's so many other flavors that you can browse. The subs are cheaper than your average energy drink, have no calories and won't destroy your stomach lining. So get some free samples to try them out and enter the anime girl shaker black market. Thank you gamer subs for keeping the lights on and that's all. Bye.